All right, here we are, the first NASCAR preseason video. I'm excited. Let's get right into it. We'll talk pricing and stuff for the site in a bit, but I mainly want to put you in the mindset of where I was at in this offseason of the main thing I wanted to focus on, the main anomaly, the mystery of Atlanta, because clearly we understand that it's a hybrid. You know, we understand that it races drastically different compared to any other racetrack that we're currently at. It makes the cars handle different. Um, and for me, that was my main off-season goal to, to figure out and at least help me understand how I want to approach it. Because since Atlanta had the repave, I've played very little and I've been very hesitant to really dive into, you know, do we stack from the back? Do we chase guys up front? Do we just go at it like a traditional intermediate race? And there's, there's a lot of question marks around it. And that was the main thing I wanted to focus on figuring out uh, in my off-season of what I want to do to approach that. Now, for those of you that may or may not know, I love plate racing, okay? Uh, in the comments of this video, you're going to find uh, basically my, my, my plate racing playbook that has like six hours of content on my old channel, but it's still worthy stuff that I think everybody should know entering. Um, like, I love this style of racing. I love watching the race and I love analyzing it. I have season tickets to both Atlanta weekends this year. Like, I'd love the racetrack of Atlanta, but I want to figure out how to really approach it from a DFS perspective. And this is where I was at during the off season. I understand this looks, looks like, this looks like a, you know, a kindergartner wrote it, but we need to first figure out what I'm looking at and what I'm looking for. And then we can start diving into the data. So when we look at Atlanta, you know, we have actually, let's go back and look at the results for these races. And so we've had, we basically had three and a half Cup races at Atlanta. Yes, we've had Xfinity. Yes, we've had Truck Series, and we can look at those on on their own terms. Uh, past this, but I'm mainly focusing on the Cup Series at Atlanta, and really it's three and a half because you know the fall race last year got rained out uh, just before halfway, and so really three and a half races. We really can't even use this one uh, in, in all honesty. So when we look at this race, we see a lot of guys up front maintain running position in the top ten, which, which isn't insane outside of plate races and we're seeing you know quite a lot of guys be wrecked out in the first race that they had in the second race still same thing roughly half the field was involved in a wreck in some form or fashion but this was what was really really shocking we have first and second maintaining first and second we had first place being optimal and uh this really threw everybody and everything for a loop we had very limited uh place differential come through like we had jones we had haley we had eric amarola come through but for a vast majority of these guys, people who started in the teens, finished in the teens or lost positions, people who ran in the back going from like, you know, 34th to 23rd is not going to bump you into the optimal. And so, you know, we finished the second race here with a drastically different outcome compared to the first one we had here. When we got to the third race, we then yet again saw in back-to-back -back races the pole sitter win this event, be optimal, lead a huge amount of laps. Like, this was insane. And... You know, entering the fall race last year, you know, we we had that approach or we had a lot of people, you know, discussing that like, hey, you know, Atlanta's a hybrid. It's racing more like 1.5. You need place differential, but you also need to, you know, chase guys who are going to lead laps and yada, yada, yada. Well, in this race here, you know, it ends under rain, but we have, you know, the pole sitter finishing 18th. We have William Byron going from 18th to 1st. We had a lot of place differential who started in the middle of the pack come through. And so at least where I stand from. Uh, I would like to find data points or something I can look at to better give me an idea or for me to be able to, or, I mean, give me a better idea of how to approach it, but give me a better idea of how to understand how these races will probably play out as we get more and more through, as we kind of project and predict how Atlanta is going to change over the course of the year. We are already seeing handling come into play a lot of the incidents in this race. And I might I remind you, this entered into the evening. Uh, so the track temperature did lower throughout this short race, but handling was huge here. Um, we're seeing that, you know, Atlanta, unlike the current racing at Daytona and Talladega, are mu is much more handling related than those two. I'm not saying that isn't important there, because certainly with a lack of practice, I mean, you, we really only have the one practice session for the 500 for all the races at Daytona, Talladega, and Atlanta. Um, but Atlanta is the one track that I would focus primarily on trying to, C races where handling was such a was the major component that we that teams need to focus on. I know that's very long winded, but you'll see what I'm getting at in a second here. Um, Atlanta was designed to age 
rapidly compared to other repaves because they were afraid that like nothing would happen over the course of half a decade. And so we're already seeing the track change color. We're already seeing, you know, handling, as I said, coming into play much more now than other tracks or other repaves and stuff. And so for me, my main goal was to find races that race similar to what Atlanta's racing at right now. And that's where the ability to go three and double file for consecutive laps is there. But we typically have some sort of breakaway for leaders, or you can ride the top line and pull away from people. You can run single file. Like the pack is still, you know, under a blanket. You're still lined up and you're basically still running together all over the track, but you're not like stacked three by three by three by three, like we see at, at, you know, certainly Talladega now, um, Daytona and stuff like that. I wanted to look at races where specifically it was much more of a handling based situation. It was much more of, of what these cars are, are able to do. And it's not just dependent on, on the pack getting, you know, three by three and you're just running in the pack. Like we're, we're, we're really seeing at Daytona a lot recently. And so for me, I was looking at tracks that or situations where the data was used or you could look at data where the track was bumpy, where handling came into play, everything I just noticed here or everything I noted here. And we can primarily see that in the early 2000s Basically, from 2010 to 2000, you can look at the 90s as well. And some people might be like, just like thinking I'm crazy for looking at this, but I think this data is pretty uh, telling. Uh, I think, it, and specifically the, day, the Daytona package uh, or the Daytona races, specifically because you have less, um, you know, less width of the track to actually make lanes. Realistically, when we look at the similar sizes of Atlanta and how the cars handle and how they push up the track and everything, it races a lot like old bumpy Daytona used to, okay? And primarily for that reason, I, I did not want to use... So this indicates the Talladega repave, which was done in, in May of 2006. And this indicates the Daytona repave, which happened following the 2010 Daytona 500. And so I'm, I was looking primarily at races from 2010 to 2000 at Daytona only from, you know, mid-2006, 2010, and then both of these tracks when handling was a huge factor. Um, and we're looking primarily at Daytona because we were still seeing a lot of huge pack racing at Daytona. Like, you know, like like the races in 2000, like, that's not very viable. Like, that's not data I necessarily want to look at. Yes, you know, handling was important, things of that nature, but the field is like four wide, you know, seven rows deep. Like that's not useful data. We're trying to figure out and pinpoint races that are, that are racing specifically like the current configuration at Atlanta. And that's primarily old Daytona. Um, certainly in the early days of the COT, right when, you know, Daytona was really starting to wear and the handling was really coming into play. If you look at races side by side, I'd put it up here, but I mean, this isn't my channel and I'm, you know, we're going to copy, we're going to get copy, uh, copy. What is it? We're going to get struck, not taken down, but like it's going to demonetize the video. Uh, but when you look at specifically current Atlanta and old Daytona from 2010 to 2000, and really primarily from like 2010 to 06, 05, 04, uh, they are racing very, very similar. Um, I mean, <laughs> there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And I think that is a spitting image of what current Atlanta is. And I said that before we started racing here. I said that after we started racing here. And I, I am solidifying that opinion after viewing the racing in person. That it is, it is 2000s Daytona. You know, like, for example, when we look at the 2010 Daytona 500, you know, most track wear that we've had, track was really bumpy, handling came into play, and a lot of these races did not have necessarily big wrecks. I know if you're either new to NASCAR or you're just kind of remembering Daytona as this, you know, wrecking for Jesus and we're just wrecking people left and right, like, that didn't necessarily happen in this time period. You know, when we look specifically at that, I'm on the wrong one, when we look specifically at that period, you know, this is what I'm wanting to look at here. When we're looking at the DNF percentage, and, and shout out to a longtime supporter of mine, um, ACS, who you've seen in, in my YouTube live streams, who was in the Discord, for helping me pull this data throughout the offseason and, and at the end of last season. He saved me a ton of time for 
doing this and he helped me color coordinate this stuff a lot but when we look specifically at that time period of the early 2000s or you know mid to late 2000s and you know certainly going into like 99 and stuff we're seeing a period of the dnf percentage of cars in these races were the lowest certainly the last 20 something years like when we look at current daytona like this isn't viable because you know as i always say over half the field's going to be involved in a wreck that's proven right here or at least not finishing the race whereas we get here in a non-repave track is track handling is important we're not seeing necessarily like three by three by three the entire time like when you look back at these races you know a good majority of it is side by side you know like from like eighth on back but the main leaders are are, are single file you know you got to remember that we did not have double file restarts in this period of time and so you kind of already forced the field to be you know single file and stuff like that and we're seeing that atlanta now to where hey once once the restarts happen everybody gets the top side and they kind of ride around and stuff so it's like time for stages and blah 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 but this low dnf percentage between these races here really you know piqued my interest when i was just kind of going over this in general and when you look and compare this to like what we're seeing in current atlanta you know and, and granted the, the dvp policy and stuff like that kind of kind of changes it and stuff but like it's pretty on par with these races especially if it was going to continue kind of going down in terms of people wrecking out like you know these are the first two races at atlanta this was okay hey boys we've been here a year we kind of understand how it's going to go we might just not want to pile into every single crash and stuff like that and uh, same thing here like another thing that i wanted to focus on was the amount of big ones and crashes when we look at these when we look at these races here yes we had crashes we always have crashes but a lot of them ended up being single one two three or four car incidents okay yes they'd almost always wreck big on the last lap like that's going to happen everywhere but in terms of where people are in the race we're not taking out huge chunks of people okay like that's just how it is like even <laughs> like 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 i said the, the 2010 daytona 500 in this instance here a lot of these wrecks happened late in the race this race went green for a majority of this event outside of the yellows for like the pothole popping up in turns one and two um and so anyway like my main goal during the off season was to try and figure out what i want to do specifically for atlanta how i want to build how i don't want to build and stuff like that and so one thing that i asked him to look at and help me figure out and stuff so like let's let's take a look at this spring race where um jay mcmurray wins and you might argue that this isn't the best way to go about it. and i understand like we're missing fast laps these races didn't have as many laps as the current atlanta race you can fix that i'm not going to but if you wanted to you could go ahead and you know multiply the amount of laps led by like 1.5 1.75 or even do the percentage of the laps led in this race like for example like uh you know i was hoping somebody would do like an even number of like 50 or whatever but like you know we have harvick leading 41 laps i'm gonna i'm gonna say he led 50 just for my brain so like if he leads 50 laps of a 200 lap race that's 25 percent of the laps led in the event you can just combine that with the 400 laps at atlanta you know and you're basically on par with what a lot of these guys are running and leading you know like joseph good old joseph logano leading nearly like whatever that whatever 140 of 400 is it's over 25 percent you know it's like what is that 35 30 somewhere around there i don't know um you know you have chase elliott you know basically right at 25 percent of the of the race ran and so you can get around you know the old daytona race is not having 200 laps by either multiplying it by as i said like one point you know whatever you want to do or by looking at a percentage and then you can kind of get more realistic DraftKings totals um if you don't like how this stuff looks or if you don't like this aspect of of, of what i'm doing here you can also just look at this like this is what the total would be you know realistically as people go through and we're looking now granted you know we don't have salaries so we can't like realistically find the uh the the optimal but you can get a good idea of, of what's being used what isn't being used and stuff like that and um as i was going through these races i was really finding that a lot of the mid daytona races really 
transfer well to what Atlanta's doing. Like when you look at the 07500, yeah, sure, you have, you know, Kurt Busch and Tony Stewart wreck themselves out. Huge, huge favorites being taken out. But the people who are up front in these races, like, you know, Harvard goes from like 11th to 1st on the last lap and stuff. But a lot of this race was Mark Martin maintained a track position up front. Yes, he started 26, but the cars that handled well, the cars that were, you know, not acting stupid or excuse me, were like the cars that felt comfortable up front were the ones who stayed up front regardless of where they started in the uh, starting grid, specifically with the Daytona 500. You have the duels setting the grid and stuff. So it's not a true representation of where these cars were in terms of setup or speed. Whereas like now we just get the supercar run, they qualify, and you end up having, you, you normally end up having the good cars start up front and the bad cars start in the back and you can see once you look at this stuff by like starting position you know the wrecks come from everywhere and yes we have you know flats and and you know people getting the wall and stuff causing uh people to wreck and stuff but these old daytona races are are really what i was looking at okay and so like yes this one's showing you know a lot of place difference came through a lot of guys scoring in the 60s and 70s we're gonna start at like 2000 we're gonna start at 2010 uh, Daytona 500 last repave so like none of these are useful like we can still look back like I have all this stuff just in general like if I want to look back and see you know who was optimal in, in the, the Daytona 500 in 2019 I have all that stuff here but uh we're we're trying to solve stuff that doesn't have answers either publicly available or just that we haven't seen so like this one was place differential um I would have liked to see what this is um giving him more laps led we're probably seeing this go from a 45 to probably like a mid 50 range if if not or if that is the situation we might have we might end up having kevin harvick be anywhere from fourth to fifth it's really more so at least in my opinion trying to figure out where these guys fall in terms of the top 10 scoring that's really all we're trying to do and what i'm trying to realize or look at specifically is what are the leaders doing up front like why you know, not why, but how to counterbalance this anomaly of starting first, finishing first at a plate race, back to back, like that, that's insane in, in general, but to have that happen back to back, and to just have it to where they couldn't pass these guys, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's really what I want to look at, because there's like no way in hell I'm ever going to play first and second in these races, you know, we go back to the, to the fall race here, um, you know, as I said, like, I don't want to play first and second. Should I? Should I not? Here's a great example, you know. <laughs> I, I'm trying to think of uh, Wally and what he's saying, you know. Here he is, there he goes, and, and Kyle goes in the wall and stuff. But Tony Stewart starts first, finishes first in this race. You know, he wrecks, uh, you know, good old good old Kyle Busch, and he gets thrown down, and then he gets, like, plastered by uh, by the nine car, by Casey Kane and stuff. But, like, here's an example of what data would, like, based on what we've seen at Talladega or at Atlanta the last two years, this is like a spitting image of another data set that you would want to throw into the Atlanta race. We have Stewart starting first, finishing first, leading nearly half of the race just how it is he leads like half the race we have denny hamlin practically lead the other half of the race okay laps letter just spread out past that but it's two guys leading leading the race you know we get here to where we mainly have you know one to two guys leading the race you know we get one to two guys leading the race even in this instance or uh uh sorry i was one over we have one to two guys leading the race even in the fall here we had one to two guys leading the race. The only reason they didn't lead more is one, you know, people were, we had rain coming, people pitting and stuff like that. But like Eric Amarola was going to lead a good majority of this race, even past lap, even past his 46 laps, you know? And so we look here and just ironically, we have, uh, uh, we have, you know, Regan Smith going from last to 12th. Uh, and this is why I like the, the spring races because more of this reflects where these guys just end up qualifying and not necessarily on the duels. Like the slower cars, like you have slow poke, you know, Gordon, slow poke, uh, Keselowski back to the name, Menard, who's like 
not like plowing through the field. They're just getting midway up the starting grid, which is kind of what we're seeing. I mean, this is the rain out, but kind of what we're seeing here. Yeah, we'll have like one guy go from last, like, oh, Ty Gibbs is in a good car. Like, of course, he's going to go through the field. But for the most part, when you're starting in the 30s, you're finishing either in the teens or 20s. So like the 2009 fall race at Daytona is one that I would want to look at that like, okay, cool. Yeah, this is a data point that I would throw into these Atlanta races, you know, and, and just looking at the starting positions, finishing positions, like, yeah, this looks pretty much like how a current Atlanta race would go. Let's see what it would look like DraftKings wise. Well, you know, it's looking like we want to prioritize, at least in this race, you know, the front half of the pack. Stacking from the back didn't necessarily kill you, but, you know, you're going to have a lot of guys scoring like 30s, certainly 30s. I think the the 20s here, you know, like we're yet again, we're missing fast laps and stuff like that. But like the 2009 fall race at Daytona is absolutely a plus. We have the 2010 Daytona race, absolutely a plus for data. I want to throw into, um, um, into the Atlanta race. We have the 2007 Daytona 500. You might just remember, you know, Harvick, you know, outrunning Mark Martin, and I talked about this one, but this is another race based on how they ran. Like, yeah, sure, we go into overtime, or overdrive as they used to call it, um, but I think this was a pretty good representation of current Atlanta. A lot of the guys who um, were involved in Rex ran, in the, ran into Rex late in the race, and if you've watched my like film, watching film video, you know that I typically like to look back and see how people were racing, where they would have finished if they didn't get involved in a wreck, and yada yada yada. Anyway, like when I when I was watching this race, I even put my notes up because I have notes on all these races. I've just watched them over the off season. Like, you know, like the 07 the 07 500 is like pretty spread out, just like Atlanta. There's like no. Double file racing for a good majority of the race. Everyone is st- everyone was still in the race with 75 laps to go, which is like you think of Daytona, you think of like, oh, everybody wrecks out and stuff. Like we are past halfway in the race. We are closing in on like the last 35, 30% of the race, and the entire field is still racing. All these DNFs come late in the race, okay? The, the race is green. You know, the top is running like on the top. They're running single file. The two best cars wreck out, as I said, that like the main lap leaders who are going to contend for it, who, you know, we have seen, you know, run up front, guys who start up front, guys who start up front. Like these, this is literally this race at Atlanta if Elliott and Chastain spin out and don't finish up front. Like this is, this is, this is just kind of where I'm at or where I would look at. A lot of this place differential comes through on these late race restarts because, you know, I think we rack on like lap you know, 190, 195, and then, like, lap 199 or something like that. Um, And a lot of the place differential comes through, you know? So, like, this, in my opinion, would be a good representation of, of this race, just removing Elliott and Chastain from it. You know, because then you have more of your place differential come through if they get involved in a... Like, the, a lot of this is just, like, hypotheses and hypothesizing and stuff, but this is just what I try and imagine or what I try and look at. And, like, I need things to do during the off season. Um, but as, like, as we continue going on, you know, we're looking specifically for instances where, like, hey, yet again, Tony Stewart, you know, doesn't win the Daytona 500 again, but he leads the majority of the race. The, the, the starting car up front is leading laps, like, dominating the race, absolutely killing the field, leading nearly half of the race. Well, this is the fall race, but leading leading nearly, actually over half of the race. He's optimal. We have the place differential coming through, another place differential coming through, place differential in the teens coming through, so we're not, like, truly digging down deep. And look at the amount of cars left running. Like, this race went green. We did not have a lot of people wreck out. This is not the current Daytona of just three by three by three, one guy crashes from the inside of row two or row three, slides up the track, takes out nine, 11 guys. Like, that is not what these races were. And that's why, as we continue to dive through and look through, like, these are, this is usable data. Yeah, sure, it's not like everything's exact from Atlanta to, you know, old Daytona. But 
hell, I think using this is a lot better than just using like three and a half real life races at Atlanta. Like that's that's how I would look at it. You know, and you can even argue, like, we'll look through the rest of these, but, like, you can even look at the 99 races and stuff. Like, when Jeff Gordon, you know, starts and finishes up front, you know, we have Rusty Wallace leading nearly the entire race. You know, a lot of these old-school Daytona races were very similar to the current Atlanta. And, you know... I've even said, like, man, I really don't want to play, you know, pole, pole setters. I really don't want to play guys up front. But if you look back at these races and you look back in, in the lens of, you know, DraftKings and stuff, trying to find that when I was just, I think it's following, like, hey, starting up front, leading laps, he's going to be optimal. Like, that is no if ands, or buts. If he has the car and guys can't just drive through the field that well, uh, like, these guys are going to be optimal. These guys are going to end up working out. You know, a lot of place difference are coming through in this race here. Uh, so you can kind of, you know, take them or leave them, whatever you want to do. But, like, this is what I was looking at, you know. Here's another thing. The uh, the 2000, uh, the, the Pepsi 400 in 2005. Here, yet again, Stewart starts first, finishes first, leads 75% of the race. Like, at this point, it doesn't matter if you want to, like, well, you know, 151 laps is not equivalent to, to 400 laps. Well, I mean, like, he led 75% of the race. Like, what it, this, this DK point doesn't even matter. He's optimal at that point, okay? What else is coming through? Just a ton of place differential, you know? Why is that? Well, this is, this is, a, this is an instance to where, yeah, sure, people started wrecking out more more things started happening and stuff, but why were people able to go through the field where you have Dale Earnhardt Jr. who went to the rear due to, that is the one thing I don't like about how NASCAR ranks starting from the back and like hindsight, like race and reference will be like, yeah, these guys start in the back. Well, they start in the back because they went to, they went to the rear. Like, uh, we see that a lot in the 500s and stuff where like we have an engine change from like the dual race to that. They start in the back and then they're credited with a, uh, a race here like i'm pretty sure the 2012 fall race will show stewart starting 42nd he did not start 42nd he went to the rear due to an engine change and won this race okay um so keep that in mind whenever we see a lot of like oh these guys started dead last and they drove up through the field a lot of these were uh going to the rear and that credits them as starting you know dead last or whatever that's why we do see a little influx of like the guy starting 40th finishing like fucking third like it's not they're not just flying through the field in some bum rocket it's because they went through an engine change and NASCAR credits them with starting last that's that's uh, one thing we want to keep in mind here but like true cars that are set up running well are finishing up front and uh yeah hopefully I mean this is where I'm kind of at this is like okay cool yet again shut good old Good old smoke, Tony Stewart, Kevin Killen, Tony up here leading more laps in these races, starting up front, finishing up front. Here's another instance. Yeah, sure. Like Mark Martin, I'm assuming, I'm assuming this is him going to the rear or maybe it's not. 32nd is very hard to start from. That might just be him on speed, but like Gordon coming from the teens, Stewart from the top 10, rear, rear, teens, rear, rear, teens, teens, teens. We're not seeing a lot of true like place differential plays come through in these old races. So like when I look at when I look at Atlanta now, like entering this year, entering this season, like yeah, dude, I probably shouldn't be as aggressive starting guys in the back because even when they get through the field and finish in the teens more so than the than the uh Daytona races and Talladega races, they really do have limited upside. It's almost more like yet again watch the uh, the the, uh, the uh, master class for the for the plate races, but it's very similar to the Talladega or not the Talladega the Xfinity series races about three four five six years ago, where you would have a colleague, you know, starting guys in the teens and like high single digits, they would run up through the field and it would kind of block off the back half of the of the field from like passing them because they just have the dominant cars and stuff you know so like this is this is i i enjoy looking at this type of stuff i enjoy really going through here's another one yet again fall race 2004 gordon starts first finishes first leads you know uh be 160 so whatever that is 
it's, it's like 30, 35 percent, 40 percent of the race. No, it wouldn't be 40. No, it'd be like it'd be 40, 38, somewhere around there. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, like Stewart's up there, you know, teammate right with him, right up there. Stewart, yet again, guys who know what they're doing. These these apps, these what was this, a Pontiac at the time? Dude, Joe Gibbs was so dominant at these plate races. But it's the same guys, back-to-back. We have Martin, Jr., Stewart, Hendrick. You know, you go through this period, it's the same guys. It was the Hendrick Chevys. It was the, uh, or motors designed by by Hendrick. And then you have a lot of place differential guys. Like, here's a great example. You know, we have Sadler starting, you know, 39th, finishes 26th. That is a good day. That is a good uh place differential day and he's just not getting up there now granted this is probably more like 34 36 because it's very difficult to go through this stuff and then properly have it score like the DraftKings, like the difference between going from 30th to 29th uh or yeah and then 20th to 19th because you have that like point gap in between so you have to add an additional like three points to those and stuff like that so it's more so like a 33 probably like a 32 with some fast laps type of day for Elliott Sadler, but we're not seeing that type of place differential go through, um, at least in my opinion. Stuff like here. Yet again, guys up front, guys up front dominating races. You know, hey, man, you know, this shit seems kind of crazy. Chase Elliott and Ross Chastain were optimal. Hey, man, this seems kind of insane. Uh, it'd be this one. You know, Joey Logano starts first, finishes first, leads a good portion of the lap. That's insane. That can't work. Uh... Because I know I was saying that. But now, looking at it, like, man, dude, these guys start up front. They finish up front. They lead the laps. It's more It's more likely to happen than not. This shit happened in real life. These were replicate, repeatable races. You know, this is where we want to look at. That's why kind of going back to what we're going, oh, which one, are, which one am I on here? We have this one. Like, this was real stuff, even with, you know, some higher DNF rates, which you're going to have anywhere. You know, hell, you look at Xfinity at Texas, and they just destroy stuff every time they go to Texas. But, like, these are real data points that you can pull at and that I think people should pull at. It's not about the driver. It's about the sit, like, who, who cares that Stewart is, you know, in, is in all of these? That's not the point. It The point is, like, who is fitting in, uh, like, what kind of situations are fitting in here, you know? You look at, um, you know, the domination of Stewart, who would kind of fill that role here? You know, most likely the Hendrick guys, most likely the fastest Pinsky car, cars that know what they're doing, cars that are set up well, cars that are going to handle either well out front by themselves, leading the line, able to stay up front, or just is just comfortable. Like, these were periods of times where if you had a bad car and you were uncomfortable, you were not going to run well. That's just how it is. And you have situations of like, hey, maybe, maybe you, you know, you're in a situation where you're like here. We're like, yeah, let's play the guys right up front. So we play like the pole sitter. We play second place. You know, they lead them. They lead a good portion of the laps. This is the fall race, 160 laps. So this is roughly, you know, probably equivalent to like leading 80 laps at Atlanta. This one's probably equivalent to running like, you know, I don't know why I keep doing percentages in my head. I'm terrible at it, but you know what I mean, like. Man, damn, you know, Waltrip was still a top 13 scorer. This this is, you know, move this up to some more laps. He's still scoring like mid-40s. You know, may or may not be awful, but he's not killing your lineups unless they just flat out wreck out and stuff, you know? So that's that's kind of what we're, or what I wanted to look at, was mainly races where they were dominated by certain guys, where those guys ran up front and where they would be hypothetically if we're looking at fantasy points and what's causing those fantasy points to be had. Is it a lot of place differential? Is it not a lot of place differential? In this day and age, yes, I'm using this for Atlanta, but in this day and age, if you were stacking from the back, you were most likely not winning GPPs. My strategy of being very heavy on the back would not have worked in this time period. That's why. Paying attention, paying attention to the trends, the Larry Mack trends of the race. You know, we're seeing that the DNFs are increasing, less practice, more volatility, people getting more and more dumb, people getting more and more stupid. 
You know, you look at the teams. You look at the teams who are who, who are causing to be optimal nowadays. It's a lot of these bum teams. Like the greens indicate good teams. The other ones are like colleague, front row, Rick Ware, Spire. Like we're seeing a lot of bad teams be optimal back then. You look at the or be optimal now. You look at races back then, it's good teams being optimal. You look at Atlanta, it's good teams being optimal. We don't really have a bunch of bums finishing up front in these races, okay? Now, you know, with that said, you know, it seems to me that the wrecks are most likely happening, or not seems to me, when we look at Atlanta, the wrecks are happening up front. It is, yes, we have had instances of people getting involved in wrecks. Like we have Bubba Wallace wrecking out early, either in this one, it's probably this one. I think it was the spring race last year. Um, You know, we have Noah Gregson spin out kind of in the back of the field. The first race that this was in, this one here, yes, like Gregson wrecks out early. We do have instances of people wrecking out early, but those are typically in the back of the field due to a a checkup. Um, We look at this fall race, like this was due to a checkup. Austin Hill just got damaged and, you know, you know, so we're not seeing um, just huge guys being taken out or huge portions of people being taken out. I don't remember who the point I was saying when I brought up a lot of the wrecks are happening up front. Like Eric Amarola blows a tire year before last while he was leading. You have Kevin Harvick get taken out in this race here. Which one is Harvick taken out in? Harvick is taken out here late in the race from the lead. Uh, a lot of these guys wreck out. At the end, when they were up front competing for the win, um, that stuff doesn't happen. We have races that most likely end up starting to look like this, you know. So um, we need to dive in more, and I personally want to look into this more and, and possibly run like as dumb as it sounds, run some of the stuff in Saber Sim and see what it would put out nowadays, or just. Uh, See if I can find one of my buddies who does like their own simulations and give them this data and say like, hey, can you back test this now with like pricing? L- let me give you old salaries and see what the builds are and things of that nature and, and kind of flush this out more. This is mainly what I've been working on during the off season. The- Atlanta was the real big unknown that I haven't really seen anybody answer yet, whether the whether the question being or the answer being can we? Is there a reason that we haven't? Is it just nobody giving a shit and want to do this? Um, that's kind of where I'm at. You know, when we look at like the 2001 Daytona 500, uh, where are we at? Earnhardt is still a, you know, a top 17 scorer, even though he dies. Like, you know, there's a lot of takeaways in these races, man. It's uh, it's huge, man. We got Ward Burton caught up in the big one, you know. The guy who you know who just dominated the who just dominated the field. You know we have, uh, I believe it's, O three when he wins. I just went blank. No, Walter. It's O two. It's got to be O two. Like Ward Burton, this year you know wins really doesn't do a whole lot. Where Sterling you know leads the entire event, gets dumb, gets out of his car. But like he ran away with the race. Like we have a lot of runaway events. You know we have Ken Schrader lead lead a lot of this race too but a lot of these races i'm at least where i'm at look very similar to the races we have been running uh lately at atlanta why is this one oh it's 500 miles i was like what is going on here this is a long race man um but yeah anyway so <laughs> that's kind of my that's kind of my early my early thoughts some of the things i've been working on in the background i will uh, obviously uh, have some preseason stuff for the clash. I'll talk about the plate racing and stuff as well. Kind of as we get into this, I can do updates on stuff of where these teams are at, where everybody's kind of falling in line in terms of certainly for the truck series. Cause we've just lost, you know, GMS, we lost KBM. We literally lost the two powerhouses of the truck series. So everybody kind of moves up a peg, but are they really moving up a peg or are they just replacing? Like, is everybody just moving up positions just by de facto? Like nobody's, first and second so like thor sport jumps from like third to first you know we have a uh, tricon garage going from third and a half or fourth to second like is it really big changes it's more changes like in the mid-tier and bottom tier of where those guys are going to go like project 46 or uh whatever the heck they're called 
I don't even remember. But anyway, so we can talk about that type of stuff. Um, and yeah, just like if you guys want me to talk about anything uh, specifically, let me know. I will talk about it. I'm mainly looking forward to the previews per week, week by week basis. All the live shows, I'm still going to do those this entire season. So we'll have a live show for every slate. Um, you know, trucks, Xfinity Cup Series. I'm looking forward to the LA Coliseum. I'm looking forward to doing live shows for the duels at Daytona mid-February. Like, all this stuff is right around the corner, guys. Like, personally, for me, I don't want to be getting all my stuff squared away. I want to know where I'm at, uh, what service provider I'm using, and, like, I'm just saying, guys, the, the best deals, not just because I'm here. Like, these are deals for me when I wa- when I wasn't employed by TrueDFS. That's why I went to TrueDFS. That's why I tried them out. I was like, wow, man, the value that you get by either getting SaberSim through this, you on top of everything else that TrueDFS offers, you know, maybe I want an idea of where, you know, kind of the industry is at on people. Well, like, we get all that stuff. You know, Sheets gets all that stuff, and then he weighs them accordingly to how he wants to with his own proprietary, you know, approach to projections. But, like, not only do we get the SaberSim projections, not only am I getting the projections that I make for NASCAR, but you get Sheets, and you get so much, you, you get you get so many projections from from like everybody here. I don't know. That's just me. We'll talk about this more in other videos. I just wanted to just get in and talk about Atlanta. I've been waiting to do that all off season. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for watching. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys in the next uh, NASCAR video. And uh, just I'm just happy to be here. I'm happy to be here at Trinity FS. I'm looking forward to the season. I'll see you guys later.